Hello, uh, I'm still Rainer Sauerborn and not Andy Haynes. Um, this is just to introduce my colleague from the London School of Hygiene, um, who gives his presentation in two parts, because it's such an important topic, the co-benefits of health from climate change, that we cut it in two. The first one is an introduction, and it goes about the air pollution, and it goes about diets. Then we stop, let you uh, take some rest. The next one is then about building and transport. So um, welcome, Andy. Thanks for joining. My name is uh, Andy Haynes. I'm from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. My background is in public health and primary care, and I've had a long-standing interest in the health effects of climate change and the implications of uh, a sustainable economy for human health. So I'm going to briefly outline the issues involved in transitioning from today's high carbon economy to a much more sustainable economy and make the case that this would have substantial co-benefits, ancillary benefits uh, for human health. So what is the scale of the challenge for a, a high income country? Um, essentially, we need to decarbonize our economies over the next few decades. And this slide really shows the scale of the challenge for a country uh, like the UK. It's, in fact, it's probably conservative. We probably need to cut even more than this slide suggests. And this slide suggests we should be going down to about an 80% cut uh, by 2050. And on the left side of the slide, you can see all the sectors that will need to contribute to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So it includes, obviously, industry, transport, electricity generation, and um, um, in, uh, in residential as well, residential buildings. Um, and um, this, of course, would be a major step, but I would like to show the implications for health of cutting emissions in these different uh, sectors. The gas that's most important, of course, is carbon dioxide, because carbon dioxide is the major greenhouse gas, and it will stay up in the atmosphere for the longest time. So, for example, if we put uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere today, perhaps around 20% or 25% of it would still be in the atmosphere in perhaps a thousand years' time. But there's also another category of, of climate active pollutants called short lived climate pollutants. They include methane um, and black carbon. Methane lasts in the atmosphere much shorter time, perhaps 12 years or so on average. Black carbon is really very short-lived, so it only lasts for a few days, maybe a week or so. But these are both important uh, contributions. In the near term, we need to reduce both carbon dioxide uh, and the short-lived climate pollutants. And this slide summarizes the separate and combined effects of reducing carbon dioxide. You can see that if we just reduce carbon dioxide um, alone, we will obviously achieve some reductions in temperature by the end of the century. But if we can reduce both black carbon, methane, and carbon dioxide, then we have the potential to get below two degrees by the end of the century. Now, when I say below two degrees, I mean two degrees of warming. And of course, that's too much. We want to get even deeper than that. Um, but this is what we can perhaps realistically aim for at the present time. And maybe with new technologies, we can even get below the two degrees of warming. Four degrees would, of course, be very serious uh, for human health and would make it very difficult for parts of the, of the world to be sustained by the end of the century. So what are the benefits that might occur from reducing our emissions? Well, the first thing to say is, of course, air pollution. And we know a lot more about air pollution than we did a few years ago. We know, for example, that um, ambient, that's environmental uh, air pollution, causes about 3.7 million deaths according to the WHO estimates. And we also know that um, household solid fuels contribute to about 4.3 uh, deaths per annum. In total, you can't add them together, so it's around 7 million deaths uh, altogether. There's some overlap between the two. Uh, but household pollution is very important for low-income countries, particularly for women and children, and it, and it kills large numbers of people. Ozone is not shown on this slide, but is also an important air pollutant kills about 150,000 people a year, but also damages the environment as well. So it, it, it reduces the crops, uh, growth of crops. So put together, policies that reduce these air pollutants can also really benefit human health. And of course, we know that for ambient air pollution, burning coal to generate electricity, 
but also cars, transport, vehicles, particularly diesel engines, also contribute to this fine particulate air pollution. So moving towards low carbon sources of energy and electric vehicles or very low emission vehicles um, can also help to reduce air pollution really quite uh, substantially. And in the household sector, moving towards either electricity, preferably from renewable sources, or if proved efficiency, cook stoves, um, or biogas and other options can also help to reduce uh, indoor air pollution. So this slide just shows you uh, some work on uh, the potential to avoid premature deaths from outdoor particulate pollution. And it's particularly focusing on strategies to reduce these short-lived climate pollutants. And a number of strategies are listed on the slide. I won't read them all out, but they include things like um, uh, switching from traditional biomass cook stoves to biogas or liquid uh, liquefied petroleum gas, or using modern fan-assisted biomass um, stoves, or um, banning of open burning of agricultural residue, just to give two examples. And what the slide shows is how this could prevent perhaps two and a half million uh, premature deaths around the world, particularly in Asia, uh, but also substantial numbers in Africa, and uh, lesser but still appreciable numbers in, in North America and other regions as well. So big potential benefits, not just from stopping burning coal, um, reducing uh, diesel vehicles, but also from some of these other strategies that will be a kind of win-win. So they benefit health, uh, they'll benefit um, crops, uh, increase crop yields, but also um, reduce climate change. And then um, the low emission um, healthy diets, this is based on some work uh, that we did uh, recently, which showed that you can reduce emissions from more uh, healthy diets. And what we showed that using an optimization modeling approach, uh, that um, we can reduce uh, emissions quite substantially without departing dramatically uh, from current dietary patterns. So Obviously, if you move towards a vegetarian diet, that would reduce um, emissions quite substantially. But our work also shows you can make lesser changes to the diet uh, by just reducing animal product consumption, eating more fruit and vegetables. And that would benefit human health, but also reduce emissions. And so um, we believe that you could get down to about 40% reduction in emissions from dietary change without radical changes to today's diet. Okay, sorry Andy to cut you. As announced, we break this in two. This was uh, the first part of the co-benefits. The next one is in the next lecture. It's about transport and about buildings.